I am Pat Kelleher, the uh, newly appointed chair of the commission, and as I was reminded by Dave Borden yesterday, the honeymoon is over. Um, um, you have a gen an agenda in front of you. Um, we already have one item of new business, um, just to touch base on something from the South Atlantic Board. Uh, is there any other items um, that would like to be added to the agenda at this time? Seeing none, um, uh, within your packet, uh, you should have received the approval of the proceedings from the October 2019 meeting. Are there any addition, uh, deletions, or any general comments on those proceedings? Seeing none, they're approved by consensus. Um, uh, is there anybody, I know we have one uh, item under public comment, um, Jay O'Dell and, and Jay Mack is gonna uh, introduce him uh, in a moment. Is there anybody else here? Not that there's anybody here. Uh, is there anybody else here uh, that would like to comment on anything that is not on the agenda? Seeing none, I'll turn it over to, to uh, Jason McMahon. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, we will hear a public comment this morning from Mr. Jay O'Dell. Uh, some of you already know Mr. O'Dell from his years of service on the commission's Habitat Committee. Uh, when he was the Nature Conservancy's Mid-Atlantic Marine Lead. He stepped off that committee a couple years ago when he took a new position as TNC's North American Fisheries Director. So he's been with TNC for 16 years. Prior to that, he had a 13-year career with the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, he worked on all aspects of fishery management, from running stock assessment surveys to intergovernmental policy coordination, so he knows very well the uh, difficulties and foibles of working for a state agency. So Mr. O'Dell will be speaking with us today about a survey that the, the University of Washington and the Nature Conservancy are conducting uh, to help characterize state managed and unmanaged fisheries in the United States. They believe that the U.S. fisheries not subject to federal management plans are a critically important and underappreciated public asset that deserves more attention and resources. And compared to the federally managed US fish stocks, there's very little national scale information available about their condition. So that gives us a, a little bit of context for Mr. Odell's public comment. And with that, I turn it over to you, Mr. Odell. Mr. Mr. Odell, before you start, I just, um, we have many people who have flights around the table um, around 2 or 2.30. We do have an ambitious agenda in front of us. So with that in mind, I just try to make sure we're concise and we can give, a, if, if needed, a few times to ask any clarifying questions. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jason, for that nice introduction. And thanks for the opportunity to see the commission talk to you today. It's nice to be back here. I will try to um, show you about five I think five, six slides in five minutes and, and try to keep it as brief as I can. Um, I'll share our motivation in, in, the, in our investment in this topic. Um, state managed fisheries, state landed species, incredibly important as you all know. Um, for example, lobster and menhaden being in the top tier of all fisheries in the U.S. in, in terms of volume and value. We've done just some preliminary estimates um, and, 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 and figure that about, well, over 25% of the total landed volume of fish, seafood products in the U.S. are um, under state management and really close to 40% of the value. So it's a big deal. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is not news to any of you all. Um, the state, uh, the federal managed fisheries are very well studied. We have the annual reports that um, tend to, um, you know, briefly dominate the news and get big press. And there's really no comparable summary information for unmanaged or state managed stocks, stocks that aren't subject to a federal FMP. Um, and we, 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 we really know that um, state managed fisheries and state managed fisheries managers um, and ASMFC staff are, tend to be overlooked and underappreciated. We want um, sustainable, you know, the Nature Conservancy is for fisheries. We want to see sustainably caught seafood in the water, in kitchens, in restaurants. 
but at a national scale, we really just can't say much about how they're doing. So the first step is to collect information and, and hence the survey. Next slide. So we're partnering, oh, I think go back one. Go back again, please. That's it. It'll, the, it'll dissolve in, it should. Uh, just uh, maybe one down arrow, thanks. Great. So we're partnering with Ray Hilborn and Mike Melinchuk at the University of Washington. We looked at what types of methods would be, uh, would be most useful and they have a very well established and published methodology called the fishery management index that is um, th that covers things such as vulnerability um, vulnerability uh, monitoring and assessment stock condition management practices enforcement socioeconomic attributes the survey is designed to be filled out by an expert um, a fishery manager um, in roughly maybe 30 minutes um, using information that's already in your head, not needing to consult external resources. Uh, our sampling design, we, we're, we're trying to pull about the top 50 uh, species by volume and by value, and addi some additional ones that were added because they're iconic or have some kind of strong cultural ecological importance. We're surveying about 28 uh, U.S. coastal states and territories and aiming to capture about 300, in the neighborhood of 300 fisheries or stocks in this, in this survey. Next. So um, we've had some initial conversations that um, folks are a little bit puzzled sometimes with the list of species that we're, uh, that we're including in the survey and the ones that we're not. Um, they will not include any that are covered under a federal FMP. Um, we know it will include a lot that are, that are basically unmanaged um, for all states. The survey um, does include um, uh, questions and space to record explanatory variables, things that are beyond the, largely beyond the control of, of managers, like climate and habitat, uh, funding levels, et cetera. Um, I go back and forth between describing this as a, as a survey of state managed species or stocks versus state landed, um, which is probably more accurate. We know that many landed species are not considered uh, or managed as fisheries. And we, we understand it's not realistic to expect that they all are. Um, we get, you know, like, what do you mean the striped sea robin fishery? That's not a fishery and, and that sort of thing. But we really want to um, just to get a handle on what's coming across the docks. We know that you all have a very, um, you know, part of the reason that, that fish and wildlife agencies um, can't always pay the amount of attention they want to to state managed fisheries is because the tremendous amount of time that you contribute to um, processes like this and particularly the, the federal fishery management process that is essentially, you know, largely um, run and powered by the, by the work of states. Uh, next. So uh, our goal is very much a national and regional scale characterization of patterns and trends for non-federally managed species fisheries. And answering questions like, you know, are some species complexes, flatfish, crustaceans, what have you, doing better than others? What proportion of landed species actually have uh, very limited information? And similar examination of some of the explanatory variables, patterns relating to commercial versus recreational fishing, um, uh, landings, proportions, climate or habitat issues, how things like that relate to stock, to stock condition and, and other things. Are there common uh, challenges with data collection, funding, enforcement? Some of these may be rhetorical questions, I'm not sure, but you know, are all state fish and wildlife management agencies underfunded? Sometimes it's helpful to have a little bit of data just to um, underpin uh, something that everyone is pretty sure is true. We really hope that we can bring some national and local attention to the challenges that the agencies face, really in service of increasing public funding. And lastly, so we are very mindful that helping with this survey is probably pretty far outside the regular duties of you and your staff. 
We're hopeful that the results will be useful in different and diverse ways, including bringing useful attention to um, your work. Um, so I would just, uh, we're, our strategy is to, uh, we know it's, it's it, in some cases a tall ask, um, and we're, um, we're reaching out through our staff in the coastal states to you and your staff. We've made some of those contacts already. Uh, we've had some initial very positive conversations and reactions and conversations in Connecticut, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Alaska, and, uh, and I think North Carolina. So um, please be on the lookout for a letter um, and, or further contacts from us asking for your help to suggest staff who would um, be most qualified to fill out the survey for species in your state. And we will be um, so um, grateful for your, for your help with this. Um, we'll owe you. <laughs> um, and we'll, we'll, we'll keep working on coastal habitat um, in, in all your states and trying to make more fish. Thanks very much. And I, hopefully I left a little time for questions. Thank you, Mr. O'Dell. I always like to hear it when a nonprofit such as the Nature Conservancy say they might owe us. Um, so just one clarifying question for me. Are you looking for one survey response from each state? Yes. Um, well, one survey response per species. Per. Um, and some states will be uh, lucky winners and might get, we would love you to do 10 species if you can figure out a way to, um, to muster the capacity to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that clarifying uh, answer. Uh, any questions for Mr. O'Dell at this time? Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that. It's very interesting. So I, I just want to be clear, state managed. So are you, you mentioned federal FMPs, but are, are ASMFC FMPs included as a, are you lump? Is an ASMFC managed species a state managed species? Or are you talking about the real unmanaged stuff? like whelk. <laughs> yes. Um, we, um, in, the, in the early design of the survey, we, we kind of scratched our head a bit about ASMFC and, and, and how to treat those species. And we decided that they are state, for the purposes of this survey, they're state managed, um, spe you know, state managed. So we are not evaluating ASMFC as a unit, as a sampling unit, but um, we are including um, some of the species that are managed by the commission. Steve. Yeah, j just a quick question. Um, so we have a lot of state, spe uh, state species that we don't manage, but we do collect landings for them. Uh, so, I mean, it, you know, we could provide that information. You can go online and find that right now. So, but I mean, they may not have a formal management plan. That's right. I think I'm guessing that is going to be the case maybe for the majority of, of the hundreds of species in this list. Um, so for those that are where the landings are tracked, there's I think three or four questions that relate to our landings data collected on a regular basis and, and such like. So um, the, we would ask that you just um, kind of try to bear with us and think about um, the species without and, and if it's not managed as, as a fishery with a specific FMP, that's totally fine. We just want to collect as much information as we can. Great. See, seeing no more hands, um, I, I appreciate, Mr. O'Dell, your time here this morning. I think this uh, endeavor, anything that can make an underappreciated state manager feel more appreciated is uh, worthwhile as far as we're concerned, I think. Uh, so thank you very much for that information, and we'll look forward to seeing the surveys. Thank you all. Um, moving down the agenda, um, item number four is an update from the executive committee. Um, I'm quickly going to go over uh, some of the conversations and the results we had from the meeting just a few minutes ago, and I'm going to ask Bob Beal to chime in if he feels like I've missed anything. Um, so one of, the, one of the first conversations we had was around a, the allocation of the plus up funds. We have about an additional $175,000 um, remaining. And after some very good conversations, it was clear that there was no, um, uh, n no final decision could be made by the executive committee on the plus up funds. Jay McNamee um, then offered to um, develop a little bit of a survey so we could um, uh, do a better job of ranking them from the executive committee. So uh, the executive committee is going to follow that process. Jay has is, uh, is, um, been 
has raised his hand and willing to lead that. Uh, so we hope to have much more um, uh, a much more polished list, ranked list, if you will, um, for a future meeting. So there'll be more to come on on that. Um, the next item um, revolved around the review of the uh, our advisory panels um, and public input process. Um, that rose from a luncheon with the governors and legislative appointees, um, came back to the executive committee. Um, uh, Tina did a great job pulling together the attendance from the advisory panels. Um, over the last bunch of years, uh, it was very telling to see a decline in uh, participation from the advisory panels. Um, we also talked quite a bit about the public hearing process and as well as the use of uh, webinars and, um, and surveys uh, as a potential tool. The end result was that there's going to be additional work from the Management and Science Committee and the Management and Science Committee will report to the Executive Committee, hopefully, at their next meeting. Um, next, there was no shortage of kind of weighty topics here. Um, next on our list uh, this morning was potential board changes based on shift in species. Um, basically, the f focus of the conversation is when is it uh, appropriate for a state to be obliged to participate in fisheries management. Currently, we have this um, we have de minimis status. Um, we've actually had states such as Maine, New Hampshire, become involved in the fishery, even though we remain de minimis because it was an interest and a growing interest with a shifting species. Um, and then we've had um, we, we certainly have other parameters that could be looked at as well. One Congress, one of the things was trying to one of the ideas was to identify very different parameters. Um, to highlight the fact that a state was much more involved in a fishery, elevate that idea to um, elevate that information to the executive committee and further to the policy board for discussions on, on whether a state should be brought into the process. There's also conversations about, for, for instance, with the South Atlantic, should there be, um, should there be a multi-species approach to this um, in areas where we have shifting stocks. No, no final answer on any of those things. I think it was a very good conversation with the executive committee. And here again, we've, um, we're going to refer some of these questions back to um, uh, the science or management and science committee. Uh, and uh, that information will ask to come either back to uh, us uh, at the May or likely the summer meeting if we've got, considering we've got uh, some additional work on their, uh, on their plate. Um, Bob, did you have anything you had to add on that one? Were you raising your hand? Or were you just exercising your, your finger? Yeah, okay. Flopping around. He's flopping around. Yeah, okay, great. Um, the next item was splitting modes um, within recreational fisheries management between REC, um, party charter, and the for hire fleet. Um, this was a very interesting conversation with very different opinions around the table at the executive committee on how to deal with this and at the end um, at the end of that conversation it was determined that we needed a working group to see if it would be possible to develop a, um, a, a broad policy that we could bring back to the policy board for further discussion in the future so um, we have asked for um, we've asked for folks to raise their hand and sign up for that I think we've got a good list started and um, you want to just touch, do you have that list in front of you, Bob? If I can read my handwriting, I do. Yeah. No, yeah. It's, I think it's uh, Cherie, Dan McKiernan, uh, Doug, Jay McNamee, Justin, Bill Anderson, um, Steve Murphy, and Jim Estes. I think that's, a, I think that's a, a good balance based on what I heard from people on both sides of the issue. I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's going to be some work to see if we can come up with a common policy on this, but um, based on the conversation, I certainly think it is, Im it, it is important. Um, yeah, usually we, add, we haven't determined a chair on that, but um, uh, this, this particular one, be, based, on the, based on the division, we may need some additional staff direction on that uh, and, and help on that. So well, f I think the committee can talk about that and determine, determine who the chair would be. 
Um, I don't have my agenda up in front of me. I think the next item um, moving on down the list was the annual meeting. Um, uh, New Jersey will be hosting somewhere in New Jersey. I don't know anything about New Jersey, no offense, um, but uh, Joe gave a, Joe, Joe made it sound like we're going to have a good time and, uh, and have to be a very worthwhile meeting. Um, so there'll be additional information on that. Where, where is it? Long, Long Branch? Long Branch. Long Branch, New Jersey. There is a, such a place as Long Branch, New Jersey. Um, it's in northern New, in New, northern New Jersey. Northern New Jersey. Um, I think they're holding it up north to make me feel better about the north. So I appreciate that. I, and I appreciate the work, Joe, that you guys are all doing on that. Obviously, the annual meetings are uh, critically important. Um, <coughs> quickly on the items that were not on the agenda. Uh, I recently, um, with the help of Bob, um, filled out um, the, um, some of the standing committees that we have here at the commission. Uh, the one that I left off was the legislative committee. And the reason I did that is the legislative committee has really been a committee that has worked on these bigger issues, bigger federal policy issues, Magnus and Stevens reauthorization, and it kind of ebbs and flows as far as its participation um, with the commission. And what I've asked um, is that we do a little bit more work to formalize that committee and have it become much more active. And so we don't, I'm not looking for everybody to start throwing names uh, forward right now, but um, Alan Bolin has agreed to chair this committee with Spud uh, acting as vice chair. And what I'm looking for is a good representation from both administrative commissioners, um, legislative and governor's appointees to participate on this committee. So if you have an interest, if you're, as you're sitting around the table, if you have, a, have an interest in this committee, please see Ellen or Spud or Bob or I, and we'll make sure you get added to the list. Um, Deke um, uh, up front um, will be the staff coordinator on this committee and will ensure that it is meeting uh, much more often. Um, and speaking of underutilized species, um, uh, based on the TNC pre presentation, there was a conversation brought forth by um, Virginia or around whelk issues, in particular um, uh, the size of, this, uh, of the individuals that are being harvested and the harvest of, um, uh, of individuals that have not reached sexual maturity. Um, there is an issue, uh, there is an agreement amongst the states uh, in regards to whelk that some coordination needs to happen. Um, I think with, with Pat Gear's help and assistance in coordinating with some of the other states, they're going to reach out to Sea Grant to see if Sea Grant might be willing to help fund and coordinate uh, a meeting um, of the states that are, have, have interest on this and maybe facilitate it. Um, but they're going to bring that back to the uh, executive committee to see if additional help from the commission might be needed. Um, Moving down the list um, is the issue um, of participation on boards. Um, the um, executive committee at the last meeting discussed the participation of uh, Pennsylvania on the Menhaden board. And the executive committee asked for some legal advice on this particular issue um, because it was um, clear in the charter that both Pennsylvania and Vermont could participate um, as it pertained to uh, anadromous or diadromous species, um, and then the and then the um, the overarching legislation was very specific to participation within the commission, but from a policy perspective. So Bob has asked for some legal advice um, based on comments from the executive committee. We've received that advice in draft form. That information is going to be finalized. The legal advice will be finalized, shared with uh, members of the executive committee as well as Pennsylvania for their uh, ability to respond to the executive committee on this particular issue. Obviously, the policy board is the board who will have final authority and say on that because of the sensitivities around it, though. We want to start, it, start the conversation at the ex executive committee, and then we will bring that forward. Um, Bob, do you have anything you want to add on, on this topic? No, I think you've covered it very well. Only one technicality. In the beginning of your comments, you mentioned that the charter limits Vermont and uh, Pennsylvania to diadermous species, which is actually the compact. Yeah, yeah. So, but other than that, I think you covered it very well. Good. Thank you. Um, 
and let's see lastly we had an issue um, around billing with APHIS I think that has been settled um, uh, APHIS is it now has to be billed by um, uh, by waves and so the states will be receiving invoices by waves instead of um, the larger uh, one-time payment that has been in the past I believe it's been a one-time payment in the past so uh, states that were having issues with that have been put on notice um, and I think everything's going to be worked out and it looks like we're moving in the right direction as far as uh, APHIS and billing around APHIS so with that I will end my comments of the executive committee is there any comments Joe Smino thank you mr. chair one and I think it's important um, going back to that rec mode split I appreciate that there's going to be a further discussion on it it's very important as you mentioned there were a lot of differing opinions but I'd like to state for the public record that everyone around that table at the executive committee agreed that the way bluefish was handled wasn't the way to go forward and we're we're certainly intending to learn from that yeah, thank you for that comment, Joe. Um, I, I did have that in my notes and forgot to bring that forward. That certainly, this this was brought up prior to, but the bluefish uh, decision certainly elevated this as a uh, topic of importance. Any additional um, questions um, regarding the executive committee meeting? Seeing none, um, let's move right down the agenda to item number five, review and discuss the 2019 commissioner survey. Deke is uh, prepared to go through the results of that. Deke? Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. The survey was initiated in 2009 and the 2019 data was collected January 6th through 20th. It is, just as last year, comprised of 15 rating questions and five comment questions. This slide shows the average score for each year of the survey and the number of participants each year. Um, this year, we had some good news. Scores increased for all but two questions uh, from last year. Uh, overall, looking at the entire time series, there's a relatively small variation in scores from year to year. Um, the average score for all of the ranking questions through all years is 7.7 and the standard deviation is 7.2. The highest levels of variation over throughout the 10 years um, are within the two cooperation questions, which is cooperation with our federal partners and cooperation between commissioners. So the, um, you could see a swing of 7.7 .7 to 5.2 with our federal partner score and the Cooperation between commissioners um, has maxed out at 8.2, but been as low as 6.5. Yep, okay, well, we're ready for the next slide. Yep, so these are the two scores that uh, declined in 2019. These are the only two. Tracking the number of stocks where fishing is no longer occurring as a metric of commission progress and satisfaction with progress to end overfishing. The uh, four questions with the biggest gains are shown here. Um, commission actions to reflect progress toward its vision, cooperation with federal partners, cooperation between commissioners, and a clear and achievable plan to reach the vision. All right, um, so these best scores are perennially at the top of the list. Um, use of fiscal human resources, um, resources spent on issues within our control, ISFMP and <coughs> science department, outputs and securing fiscal resources for the commission. The worst scores uh, from this year are ability to manage rebuilt stocks cooperation between commissioners and progress to end overfishing. So then we move on to the comment section, which I think um, is, provides a little more insight into what folks were thinking this year. So um, the, I, I've underlined the first three because these seem to be persistent um, 
issues from year to year, so I, I put them right at the top. Um, impacts of climate change, cooperation among states and commissioners, and, the, and again, cooperation between ASMFC and our federal partners. Some other issues that stood out, I didn't list every single um, answer, but some of the larger themes include responding to new information, especially stock assessments and the new MRIP FES survey, um, balancing socioeconomics and conservation, commercial versus rec interest, uh, conservational equivalency came up, and then uh, prioritizing all of the commission's uh, species groups. Um, then some areas for increased focus and resources that were identified was, um, again, stock distribution and abundance shifts and uh, tying that in with allocation, the frequency of stock assessments. Um, we heard more uh, a request for more technical analysis of some of these um, issues like juvenile indices, environmental variables, and habitat. We had a couple calls for uh, more involvement from the law enforcement committee. Um, there was a comment about improving conservation practices, um, which has been occurring uh, for striped bass. There were a couple calls to finalize the risk and uncertainty policy. Um, and there were a handful of different um, comments about federal legislation. Um, uh, addressing discrepancies between the Atlantic Coastal Act and the Federal Magnuson Act. Um, and then there were a few comments tying back into distribution and allocation and climate change for some legislation possibly to deal with that. Um, then the kind of wrapping up, um, the most useful commission products are pretty similar from last year, so you can um, read those but um, a lot of them you get in your inbox and then the other thing that that were big was just um, being able to reach out to staff for you know various issues that you have um, there were some requests for new products and I think um, a lot of these if you don't aren't readily able to find them if you reach out to staff they should be able to help you um, you know, like if you're trying to get a table from one of our publications, um, if you reach out to Tina, she can provide you an electronic copy that's in a format that you can get that. Um, so if you have questions about any of those, I think um, just go ahead and reach out directly to staff. Um, and the, there are a couple logistical things from the comment section that folks were requesting electronic motions. Um, they would like to see a mo little bit more of a democratic process uh, with regard to opportunities to speak at board meetings um, and a, a few technical things. But I think um, with that, I'll end my presentation and um, th I thank you for the time. Great. Thank you very much, Deke. Um, any questions for Deke? Lauren. Uh, yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Deke, for that report. Uh, I was very interested to um, uh, on the slide that showed the number of responses uh, over the last, say, 10 years. Uh, it looked like this past cycle and a year before that, there were 31 responses. Uh, and in, I believe that eight or nine years ago, there was, uh, there was a 21 responses, sort of a, uh, um, the lower, lowest uh, figure presented. Uh, could you please um, relate to us uh, any um, strategies that you might have to Im increase the percentage of responses? And it would be helpful to know what uh, the number 31, what, what is the percentage of, uh, that that uh, would indicate uh, of responses? Thank you. Uh, so there are one response per commissioner. Uh, so not if you have a proxy you just submit one form so that would be approximately two-thirds uh, 66 percent response rate um, we open the survey we try to send reminders and uh, keep it open as long as we can noting that we have to finalize it in time to put this on the briefing materials uh, so we we start 
um, about as early as possible in January this year. And I think we kept it open until two days before supplemental materials were closed. And there were two to three reminders, uh, email reminders sent out to folks. John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Deke, is there any way to save your survey for me? Because when I saw how small the changes were in some of those questions, I just kind of wonder if I might have given it like a slightly higher mark this year than I did last year. And I, it would be nice to know what I actually voted on some of these things last year. I remember that comment from last year that you made. And I, I looked into it. And because it's anonymous, uh, we, we don't have the option to really pull that out for you. Um, we also use the free version of this software, so we um, each year the survey goes on. We're a little more limited in the uh, in the um, add-ons that we can use, um, but I could definitely look into that again. I'll just have to remember to write down my responses then. Thanks. I'm glad you offered that, John, so I didn't have to. <laughs> um, any additional questions for Deke on the survey? Um, so. In looking at the survey and, and, and Deke's report, um, the one question I have for the policy board is, is, is this a valuable annual survey? Should, the, should this be spread out? Do we utilize it? I mean, I went through, looked at the answers, and saw there, and, and it's nice to see, as Spud just said, you know, we've had a lot of turnovers, turnover, but the scores are remaining pretty consistent, which um, is, is telling as well. So any thoughts about the use of this annually or whether we should be thinking about using it differently? Jim Gilmore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I think it's still useful for some corrective actions. Like I know uh, there was the one comment about uh, maybe monopolizing conversations, and I think that's a part of um, maybe that parliamentary training, which we're going to do again. And, you know, for all the new commissioners, you're only supposed to speak once. Now, that's up to the prerogative of the chair, and I'll violate that as much as anyone. Sometimes you're talking six, seven, eight times. But I think with that training, and again, we sometimes if you don't have this survey, you start getting away, into, or you get back into bad habits. So I think it's still useful. And I'm glad you said you violated it, so I didn't have to. Um, any, uh, any additional comments on the survey? And any, any, anybody want to object to its annual use? Do we are all in agreement with Jim? We should just continue it. No big strong feelings. Why don't we? Why don't we continue? We got a couple of nodding heads now to continue. Okay. Thank you very much, and and thank you, Deke, for that uh, for that information. Um, moving down the list, uh, discuss strategies to incorporate ecosystems management into interstate fisheries management processes. We've got Tony Kearns and Katie Drew. Katie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, I'm sure many of you were here yesterday for the Menhaden Board um, meeting and the discussion and sort of the final, the first reveal of the ecosystem reference point assess assessment for Menhaden. So that obviously has implications for not just Menhaden, but a lot of the species that we manage. And so I think we wanted to start this discussion at the policy board um, to talk about issues outside of Menhaden, species outside of Menhaden, and how to start bringing the ERP approach into the commission com fully. So I'm just going to go over a quick review of the 2020 ERP assessment. I know a lot of you did see this yesterday, but I think it's good to refresh it um, for everybody. Talk about some of the implications for other species, and then Tony's going to take over and talk about political uh, potential strategies for moving ecosystem-based management into the ASMFC process from sort of a FMP or from a ASMFC process perspective. So the 2020 uh, ERP assessment was reviewed at the end of 2019, accepted, passed peer review. It was accepted for management use yesterday. And the accepted model um, from the assessment process was what we're calling the NWAX mice model. This is an ecopath with ecosim, or EWE model, that uses a limited number of predator and prey species where we have the most confidence in the data and where those species are most relevant to the commission. So that includes predators such as striped bass, blue fish, weak fish, and spiny dogfish, as well as prey in, um, such as menhaden, Atlantic herring, and bay anchovy. This tool allows managers to examine the trade-off between menhaden harvest and predator biomass. So I'm going to go through our um, 
rainbow plots in a moment because I think they really illustrate the fact that there is no one right answer for ERPs. And this is something we tried to stress to the Menhaden board, but it's also relevant to the commission as a whole, that the right answer is dependent on the management objectives for this entire ecosystem. So what do you want your predator populations to look like? What do you want your predator fisheries to look like? How heavily do you want to be able to fish these predators? And what do you want your prey fisheries to look like? Is it valuable for you to try to maximize harvest of some species over others? And to do that, we can use the NWAX mice tool to kind of look at these trade-offs. So this is the graph that you guys all saw yesterday without any lines on it. Because the important part here is you have striped bass F on the y-axis, you have menhaden F on the x-axis, and those colors represent what happens to striped bass biomass at, if you fish them at these different rates. So what you can see is that you have those red colors up in the corner where you have high striped bass F and high menhaden F gives you low striped bass biomass. And then it moves into those cooler colors and you have um, higher striped bass biomass and higher um, under lower striped bass F and lower menhaden F, which makes sense when you think about it, that the more menhaden that are available to these predators, the better they'll be able to do. The less you're fishing them, the better they'll be able to do. Um, but then you, you get the question of, well, where should you be on this plot? What is that right intersection of striped bass F and menhaden F? And the answer is, it depends on what you want. So we can put these curves on the graph where you have these solid black lines where you have where biomass is equal to the biomass threshold for striped bass and where biomass is equal to the biomass target for striped bass. But each of those lines still represents a, a combination of striped bass F and menhaden F. So if you fish striped bass more heavily, you have to fish menhaden less heavily in order to keep it at its target or to keep it at its threshold, and vice versa. If you fish menhaden more heavily, you have to fish striped bass less heavily in order to keep them at their target or keep them at their threshold. So even if you fish striped bass, once what the, the Menhaden board saw yesterday was that once you start limiting the possibilities here, that you fix your Menhade, that you fix your striped bass F, say, at the F target, then there is essentially one menhaden F that will keep you at your target and one that will keep you at your threshold. Um, so that's that straight line across is, is the striped bass F, and you can see where it intersects with those curves. And there's where you can, those are, the, those are your two options for menhaden F. However, I think you understand that this is relying on the striped bass board having set the F target and the biomass target and the biomass threshold for striped bass already. So in a sense, that limits the options on this plot. If you decrease the striped bass F, you can keep them at a different biomass with a different level of menhaden F and vice versa. So the Menhaden board is going to go forward with ERPs that allow other species to meet the reference points in their own FMPs, more or less. This is, there's still some discussion going on at this, but to a certain extent, this is sort of the next logical step, and we're going to provide some of that information to help the board evaluate this. But this is sort of, this is what you can do. And to be clear, this is a huge step forward um, for ecosystem-based management, but this is only the first step. These other reference points are set without considering the ecological trade-offs or the ecosystem management objectives. So our predator species already have their single species reference point set in the single species context. And there is no, con there is no chance right now for, or no opportunity to use this tool for other species. Um, so right now, we've already fixed our striped bass. We've set those lines on the plot, and the question becomes, which is great, we can move forward with that, but the question is really now, how do we bring this conversation and this tool into other species um, and into the commission's management process? Thanks, Katie. Uh, <clears throat> so then we'll move into these questions. Oh, man. Uh, I think it's the computer. So then this leads us to questions for the, the commission as a whole is how do we want to manage ecosystems, ecosystem management? And 
uh, how do we want to move forward with this? Uh, and Katie has shown us that, you know, an action taken by the Manhattan, Manhattan Board could have the potential to have an interaction with another species management board. And should one species management board be able to have implications for another species management board or not? Uh, the model that was presented um, for ERPs includes uh, four predator species and three prey species. Um, some of those species are managed by the commission solely and others are jointly managed with our federal partners at the councils and some of them are complementary managed by our partners at the federal councils. Um, and so what I think that there are a couple of things that the commission, the policy board needs to think about um, in terms of ecosystem management before we, I think, make final decisions on sort of how to, how to manage these, is what is the goal of ecosystem-based management for the commission? Um, I have on the screen some goals that are set by NOAA um, for ecosystem-based fishery management. Um, and then the Mid-Atlantic Council has um, ecosystem area, uh, uh, ecosystem approaches to fishery-based management. Um, and so these are just two um, goals that are out there. Um, but we may want to have a policy that takes into consideration the full range of cumulative effects and trade-offs across very various management regimes and human uses, as well as the impacts of these management decisions to our full environment. Um, the, um, and I think that we'll also have to think about does the board want to include the full gamut of species that are in the NWAX mice model? Or do you just want to take into consideration one or two of the species and how we manage this as a first step? Um, and if any of those species, like I said before, are not solely managed by the commission, then how do we bring in our federal partners? Um, you know, and Katie provided, you know, an example of the striped bass. Um, and we know that coming up, it's highly likely that the striped bass biological reference points are going to change, which will then change how the ERP reference points look. And, you know, how, how do we manage that? Do we have joint board meetings? Or does that decision come to the policy board or some other management board that's created? So I think there's a lot of questions about that need to be answered by the commission before we move forward on how to utilize this framework. I'll leave it at that for now. <laughs> Leaving it at that for now. Um, thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, <laughs> Any any questions for Katie or Tony on this topic? Don't all jump in at once, Steve, and then Richie White. Yeah, so I I think this is incredible work that you guys have done. I mean, this is exciting to be here when you when we're taking these big steps. Um, we've kind of talked about the forage role in in the ecosystem-based management. But to me, sort of a big missing link in that is, is sort of a habitat I inclusion, right? And so often it, it's the habitat that's the limiting factor. And, you know, I, I certainly don't, wouldn't know how to begin to even include that, but I'm wondering if that is an approach um, that has merit in the future, bringing in some sort of habitat uh, part of this uh, type of look, you know, in, in ecosystem management. Yeah, I think, well, I think the short answer is that's definitely future work. Um, I think it's, the key is really understanding the effect of, we can go out and we can measure habitat to a certain degree, and we can measure changes in habitat over time, but then connecting that back to sort of a mortality component or an effect on the population is difficult. But I do think that is one of the longer term goals of this project is to have more spatial, um, and we talked yesterday, more spatial and more seasonal components, and that can include environmental drivers, which could be linked to habitat habitat and things like that. I think obviously the more moving parts you have in this, the more complex it becomes and the more key data is really what's limiting you. But I think 
moving forward, that's certainly a um, something we'd like to include in a more holistic framework. But kind of how do we how do we bring that in in sort of intermediate steps going forward? I think is something for the policy board to discuss. Follow up. Yeah. So. So we, we have, it, there is a lot of data out there on habitat and spatial mapping of that habitat, whether it be hard bottom or SAV. And so what, what I kind of don't see the connection in, um, and, and, and we tend to do this, you know, we do it on a state level where we look at the, we look at the habitat and the habitat protection, and then we're over here managing fish on, the, on another uh, side, but we don't look at, um, sort of the spatial extent of say, uh, you know, high salinity SAV habitat versus uh, stock status of a fish where that is a key part of the life history. And, and that's, that's kind of like, how do you plug those two things together? I think is the big question that we need to, to ask for. Otherwise, I think this type of approach gets you so far and then it's not gonna produce any more results. And, and you really have to bring in that that component in, in order to make it sort of a more holistic approach to this. So, thank you, Steve. And to com you know, to complicate that the whole concept even more is the effect of climate change on all of that, right? So, certainly, um, as Katie said, more work needs to be done <laughs> in the future. I've got um, Richie White and Mel Bell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are you looking for just questions or comments? Uh, uh, questions or comments are fine. Okay. Um, yeah, thinking about uh, this since uh, since the meeting, um, and thinking about the role of the policy board, um, I think we uh, ended up in a lucky place um, where things all fit together with bluefish, striped bass, and Manhattan. Um, so I'm hoping we adopt uh, the reference points in May. And then I think we have to see how that plays out when things change, because I, I, I'm not sure we can figure out uh, exactly a policy that <clears throat> will take us through uh, dealing with uh, councils uh, and the service, uh, thinking uh, dogfish and even bluefish councils. So um, <laughs> in, in, until the, the perfect situation that we now have, uh, until that changes, we're not, we're, I think it's going to be hard to predict, you know, what an overall policy would be until we kind of get into that situation and then try to figure out, okay, how do we deal with it? So. Mel Bell and then Jay Mack. You ought to echo Steve's comments about, I mean, this is a tremendous amount of work and great stuff, and you, we're really on the cutting edge here. As I've been dealing with the concept at the council level and talking about ecosystem-based management and, and at our SSC meetings and asking the question, well, how, how does this actually, what's it going to look like when we get ready to do it? So we're, we're now at the point for us anyway where we're considering implementation of this. So I w <clears throat> when we were talking about uh, Menhaden and striped bass, Menhaden and striped bass, I get that, and that's fairly simple, but then yesterday, you remember we had the graphic, we added on four more species. So to, to one of your points you had up earlier, if, if we can start simple, if it's not too, um, if, if it's not, um, I'm not oversimplifying this, but the, it seems like if you can sort of start at a level where you're trying to uh, look at the effect of, of one thing on another species and kind of keep it down to you're juggling two balls, instead of trying to juggle six balls at once. If, if we can take that approach, uh, that would be great. Um, and then kind of work into it and, and we, we see how that, if we get an outcome from a, you know, an action over here results in potentially uh, an outcome here and we actually stay on the graph um, as predicted, uh, that would seem to me to be, you know, kind of the, if we can start simple then move towards more advanced unless that's unless I'm totally oversimplifying this because I realize all of those other species that we listed and a bunch of them that we didn't are you know involved in the overall what what happens with Menhaden or, or other species but if we can start simple 
and demonstrate the concept, sort of a proof of concept that helps us build on that. And then, then we, it's kind of a um, crawl, walk, run approach maybe, if, if that's reasonable. That, that'd be my suggestion. Uh, thank you for that, Mel. Uh, I've got Jay McNamee and then John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm actually going to just support what uh, Mel just said. I, I think um, taking this sequentially is the way to go. We've got um, our current situation, which is great. Um, we kind of let the predators dictate, you know, where their Fs are going to be, and we adapt to Menhaden to it. And then the next step could be, okay, now we're going to get Menhaden and Striped Bass together and try to think about it a little more comprehensively and then scale it up from there. We need to kind of start small, see how it can work in uh, this more controlled way. I think that is the, by far the best approach to do it that way. And I think that will give us time as well. I, I think there are some... Um, you know, additional tools, additional things to think about that can help when we get into the, the more complex scenarios down the road, applying some economics theory like game theory and, and Nash equilibriums to try and figure out, you know, what's a nice spot for all of these things rather than trying to wrestle each other. You know, oh, I want mine at F target and, and no, you can't be that sort of thing. Um, we can get a good spot to start using some of these economic theories and then adjust from there. So we need some time for that, uh, but let's baby step our way up. I thought that was a great way to put it. John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This really is uh, very uh, cutting edge, interesting work. Um, a comment made yesterday, I think it was Bill Hyatt brought up about the seabirds, and I know they're not in the model, but it did set off a uh, cautionary note in my head because uh, we've I saw the same emails from some of these birding groups and as you know we already have a species where we're managing horseshoe crabs uh, in conjunction with a bird species and the uh, most recent assessment of the Delaware Bay stock of horseshoe crabs showed the female population is back to a level where we could possibly allow some female harvest but of course on the bird side that is not the case, and I would say, just knowing the uh, the other parts of the situation, the the other aspects of the situation, I doubt we're going to see female harvest of the Delaware Bay stock anytime soon. But just as we go forward with this, just something for us to all be aware of is that uh, once you start adding these other species, it can be probably hard to keep some of these other ones out. And I was just wondering if that's been a consideration so far. So I mean I think the the species that are included in the model can be dictated by the policy board and the commission. So we focused on species that from a scientific perspective had the best available data and also from the trawl survey diet data in, indicated they were major predators of uh, menhaden. These were basically all of the, this was the top set of species that had the largest component of menhaden in their diet based on the trawl survey data. Um, but you know, I mean certainly there is a policy component of it, and if it becomes important to the board to consider seabirds or whales or marine mammals, I think that's something they can dictate to the ERP group, and we can work on incorporating that into the model. I will, I will say, I will say, I think the the horseshoe crab arm example is a great example and should get more credit as really the first ecosystem approach to fisheries management that this commission did and has been in place for a while. But the way the arm is set up is it doesn't really allow other sources of mortality on that bird population. So obviously the ability to provide food for the birds is an important part of their survival, but you're also missing a lot of the other sources of mortality on that population that's not linked to horseshoe crab fishing. The EWE model allows more sources of external mortality, including fishing on these other predators. Um, and as we saw yesterday, you can't rebuild striped bass by Menhaden alone, and this model can recognize that. So there is a little bit of difference in how those man models are set up, and hopefully we could incorporate some, some of that information into the NWAX mice model if we were to ever try to incorporate birds into them as well. If I could just, if I could just follow up, for, that, that's exactly where I was, what I was heading towards, Katie, is just that, you know, that, that data will be out there for a lot of these other species and there will be pressure put on. Once you've started adding species, it's gonna be like, well, how can you consider 
spiny dogfish but not consider right whales or whatever you know i mean i'm just saying it's going to be a uh, it's going to be very interesting moving ahead with this because for all its uh, benefits it's going to add a lot of complications too somebody always has to bring up right whales justin davis and joe Semino. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'll, I'll join everyone around the table who's spoken so far in saying that I, I think this is a really exciting development. Um, you know, I've been involved with fisheries management for about 20 years, and the whole time I've been in the field, people have been talking about ecosystem management. It's been a lot of challenges to actually implement it. Looks like we're getting ready to take a potentially a big step here, which I think is great. Um, I will also join the call for incremental moves. I think making a big move right off the bat is not only going to be challenging, but also might be difficult to sort of explain to the public how we're radically changing potentially the way we manage some of these species. Um, I think the NWAX mice model, without really changing any of the way that our boards are comprised right now or, or how we're managing, can immediately play a role in our process because it can just be used as another source of information when we're making decisions about how to set reference points or goals for any of these species, menhaden, bluefish, striped bass. It's just another source of information that can tell us what we're potentially going to achieve with different goals and objectives. So I think without even changing a whole lot, it can really add to our process. Um, it does seem to me that if we wanted to go another step further, if the commission made a policy decision that essentially predator fisheries, predator populations are going to be the priority, that then we can set goals for those fisheries, for those stocks, and then manage Menhaden in a way to support those goals. And we could do that by an amendment to the Menhaden FMP, possibly, where we make explicit in the FMP that we'll set ERPs that allow us to fish bluefish, striped bass, whatever else, at F target. Um, so that would be one way without changing our current single species board composition of essentially making a decision about trade offs using this tool and doing more ecosystem based management. So I think that's something to consider. Um, in terms of combining boards, coming up with a, you know, I, I think that may be where we ultimately have to head, but I think that's a tough thing to think about now and to think about how we do that. I see that as something that's maybe three, four, five years down the road. I, I think that would be tough to accomplish in the short term. So I would just hope, you know, then in thinking about how we're going to move here, that we find a way to use this new tool immediately to improve our management process without having to engage in a multi-year, three to five year process of trying to take the next step. Thank you, we've got Joe and then Marty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This was something that I was thinking about during the uh, Menhaden Management Board and the task that we gave to the ERP. Um, a species like weakfish where um, F, F values really don't play a role at this point, I think the boards have to consider maybe shifting some of these species, like weakfish in particular, to that other level of whales and birds, and, and what is the biomass target that we feel there's an interaction and there needs there is a need for these prey species and not just having it based on F values. And I'm sure there's a con conversion currency there, Katie. I, I wanted to ask you and Matt about that a little bit. Of course, Menhaden was going long, so. Thank you, Joe. Marty? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just jumping on the train that I'm hearing around the table of simplification and an iterative sequential process. And I don't know if that would be, as Jason said, as simple as um, striped bass on the predator side of the equation in Menhaden, um, or maybe um, in the spirit of geographic inclusivity, um, adding um, striped bass and, and weak fish, uh, something that all of our member states can, can get around uh, with Menhaden. Um, but just a thought. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Um, any additional questions or comments? So, path forward. Uh, we obviously don't need to make a decision today. The Menhaden Board um, uh, is, has advanced the use of ERPs um, as a tool. We have had a motion to postpone, not to postpone, but to um, task the technical committee for further information in regards to the other species. I think that's information that will be very useful for the Menhaden Board and for all of us in the future. 
Um, I know for myself, as I've thought about this issue, um, you know, it, it took us over 10 years to get to this point. Um, the concept of baby steps rings very true to me that we don't want to rush into this. I do. I would have concerns. I understand right where I understand where Richie White's coming from. We want to make sure we can utilize these as as a tool for management. Um, but I want to make sure that we also think through the policy ramifications as it pertains to this. Because if we utilized it, jumped in with all these species, the scenarios and the management scenarios could become very complicated very quickly. You have multiple management boards from the New England from the council perspective as well that would overlay here from the mid in New England which certainly would complicate things going forward. Um, and then there's the human nature side of this that we've never dealt with before as a management body. We sit here around a table and in a silo, one species by, by species by species, and all of a sudden we're gonna be at a species management board thinking, how do I wanna vote here as I think about what I'm gonna do later in the week with, with Menhaden or with striped bass? And that's certainly a dynamic that we've never had before. Um, and, and one I don't think we should just glance over as something that we can work through. I think we, we do need to be thinking about that. Um, and it could be that we just need to be thinking about it more between now and, and the spring meeting. We're obviously gonna have a report back from Menhaden. Um, I, 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 other than Marty bringing up weak fish, I think there is some, looks to be some consistent thoughts and nods around the table as I was watching about um, starting slowly with Menhaden and striped bass. But the question to the policy board, is there anything that you believe we should be doing between now and the spring meeting to think through some of these scenarios, think through some of the dynamics from a management perspective uh, as it pertains to the use of ERPs. Craig. Who we got? Craig. Craig, we got Craig and I see another hand over here. Adam. And Adam. The biggest takeaway that uh, the information has provided me was the affirmation of the appropriate action that we have taken with these species. I think that was highly valued. And, uh, and gives us uh, the sense that there is no real urgency here, there is no crisis. And with that, uh, my recommendation would be a side-by-side -side approach to see how they, they can be worked out and give it, give it some time uh, in the future. And if we can apply, I am excited about the idea of uh, looking into uh, striped bass and the weak fish issue uh, on the same level. But, uh, but the cautionary period uh, to see these work out together uh, and make them match up for this for this board and commission, I believe would be prudent. Thank you, Craig. Craig Adam, Adam Nowalski. So I would not be in favor of anything at the policy board level outside of continuing to monitor what the Menhaden board is doing right now, and my reason for that is because. I believe the Menhaden board with the motion that came from your state, Mr. Chairman, essentially took the next step for us with regards to asking for what would this look like under different stock status levels, different fishing levels for a number of different species. We took four or five different species. We've asked to see what those different variables would look like potentially. That to me was the next logical step. So I think the board did that work for us. We should continue to monitor that work, see what the outcome of it is, learn from what that board is doing, and then revisit this issue later in the year. Thank you, Adam. I've got Spud and then we'll go back over here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just looking ahead to May and just want us to all be conscious of something that could possibly happen. If, if we convene as a Menhaden board, which is pretty much everybody that sits around this table right now, and we make a decision to adopt 
ERPs based on the analysis presented, and then we come back here as a policy board, and everybody's discomfort level goes up, and we say, oh, well, it's premature, and we're worried about unintended consequences, and then we sort of contradict what happens at the Menhaden board. That's going to send a really strange mixed message out to the to the folks that have been watching this process for all these years. So just, I don't know how the Menhaden board will go, but I, you know, I get a sense that there's going to be a a lot of interest in moving forward with the adoption of some ERPs on Menhaden based on the models that have been presented to us, the, the results of those models. So again, just thinking ahead is something I think we all need to be pondering on as we move towards that meeting. So it's, 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 it's my belief, I, I'll come right to you then, it's, it's my belief that this policy board is the, is the final word on what species will we, the Menhaden board can't determine an action that's going to impact the other species board, right? So the policy board is going to have to make a call on what species are going to be um, included with, with the ERPs. Is there, is there any disagreement with that from a policy perspective? Okay, seeing none, we're all on the same page there. Lynn? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was going in a little bit in the same direction as Spud that just I think we do need to go home and think about May because in May we're going to see a range of values now. So we're going to have a range of ERPs and their associated values. And then it is likely at that point that the Manhattan Board will choose to adopt one of those values. And so at that point, then we have simultaneously a striped bass board that is on the cusp of developing a new amendment um, and there's talk about new diff, you know switching up the reference points for striped bass so what that does is when that happens that will change that value for whatever the Menhaden board adopts so there I think there needs to be and I think Justin, you might have said it that you know we could set a policy where we're going to we're going to prioritize the predator species and fish them at their targets and their biomass, but we need to be cognizant of a situation with a fishery like Menhaden, where the striped bass board could make an amendment decision that is going to very much impact you know, that, that fishery. So I think there has to be a place when we adopt, when, the, when we, if, if, and when the Menhaden Board adopts, I think we have to be very ready for how we're gonna handle that feedback. And I agree completely with the sentiment around the table that we should start simple and we can do due diligence in looking at how trade-offs happen when we set tax for Menhaden and reference points for striped bass, but I do think that we need to be ready in May to figure out how that feedback loop is going to happen so the striped bass board isn't, um, you know, uh, just by accident pulling the rug out from under, under the Menhaden fishery. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, Spud, you got something you want to add? And I, and I think that that speaks to something that I that I brought up yesterday in the form of a question, and that is the synchronization of, of how these board actions occur. And, and because if if you get disconnects in decision making, and in stock status determinations, then you start adding in problems. To because you know so as I understand it, that we would probably have another run of the single species assessment and I guess conceivably the the multi you know the ecological reference point model in 2023 something like that 2024 I mean, we're talking about three-year cycles so <clears throat> the amendment would probably go into effect around 2023 and then you'd have a new assessment so we you know that's a resource management issue of how we man how we manage our our science assets and how we manage our our, our management assets. So it's just something that we're going to have to, again, this is a, a paradigm shift of how we synchronize things different than what we've been doing in the past. Jim Gilmore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think one effort we should probably all do to help this out is as we go between now and the May meeting is to engage our stakeholders so that they understand how complex this is. I think there were comments from yesterday about I was kicking the can down the road, and I don't think the general public or a lot of the groups understand that 
we're really going from single species, first through multi-species, into ecosystem because um, we've only got a couple of species in this. And when we started this a decade ago, that was the big concern. How do you get a dozen or more species, habitat, everything factored into this um, with no data and whatever? And uh, so we really have to do this um, in increments so that we make sure we don't completely undermine our efforts to manage the resources. So I think that effort um, for a lot of the groups that are watching us right now is going to be worth the effort so that they understand we're not kicking the can down the road. We're trying to implement this uh, appropriately and successfully. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. I've got Mel and then Jason. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You, you kind of brought this up in thinking towards the future. Let's say we do initiate a uh, process here and we start, we start <clears throat> slowly. But at some point, uh, this might get more and more complex. And as you said, it's going to touch on different, <laughs> how different boards might work together. So one way um, you can kind of uh, explore how your what I'll call command control structure, your, your, your plans, your instructions, your operations, how they work under different scenarios is you can do the equivalent of sort of wargaming or tabletop exercises and you, you work in different scenarios and see how your, you know, how does your structure adapt to that? I mean, what changes might you need to make? Who needs to be involved in decisions? So that's kind of more of a, an exercise in exploring future use of this or how it might um, how this this process might play out uh, in our current structure here, but but that's you know to the degree that you can you can invest time in that sort of we'll call it training or or exercising you sort of exercise the ASMFC's current structure and uh, authorities and uh, you know policies instructions procedures but that's just something for the future to think about. Thanks, Mel. Jason? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I actually, my thought is something I just wanted to put on the table as a kind of a parting thing. So if you have, if you're driving at something, I can, as long as I can stay in the queue, I'll park it for now. Why don't you go ahead, because I am ready to kind of give some direction and thought on next steps here. Okay. Um, the other consideration, so we're um, wrangling with the um, the notion of this interaction between boards uh, and that's good and so we'll kind of come to a, a resolution there the, there's another aspect I just wanted to make sure people are aware of so it doesn't catch them off guard at some point in the future and not only is there this interaction between species but the other characteristic of ecological reference points is the reference points move depending on what's going on. And so I just want to make people, this is another thing we're going to have to think about because it's outside of our current paradigm. It's not static anymore. It moves unless we develop some you know, system around it where we buffer so that it can stay static um, through time. So again, just another thing to make your brain hurt between now and, and the spring. I always appreciate your added thoughts, Jason, to make my brain hurt. Um, it's, so several of us had conversations around kind of next steps, where do we go from here, and, and, and almost every one of the thoughts that has come up around the table here today. I think we were wrestling with do we need kind of a work group across species. However, considering that there seems to be kind of a, a growing consensus here for a simple start to scale up this process. Um, I, my belief is we should, let's let the Manhattan Board continue its work. Let's get the report back from the Technical Committee. And in the meantime, instead of a working group, I think if we can continue to talk, we, we all have good relationships with each other. We're all interacting with each other from through different meetings. Let's, let's continue to think about this um, uh, as it pertains to you know, as, as Jay just brought up, these moving reference points, um, these, these the, the, the human dimension of management um, as it pertains to managing one species for another um, and the complexities around that. And less, um, I would recommend that we just continue this conversation at the next policy board meeting uh, and then see if at that point in time, 
whether we're going to need um, uh, potentially a work group to kind of look towards the development of a goal. Um, the, the term goal has been has come up here several times here today, and I think I think in this case um, a goal a goal with some objectives to help give guidance um, not only to this policy board but to potentially striped bass and menhaden is going to be a, a valuable tool. So with that, uh, unless anybody has any objections or additional thoughts, I'm going to move on. Seeing none, that's the direction we'll continue. Thank you very much for that discussion. Um, moving on to item number seven, uh, progress update on benchmark stock assessments for shad and lobster. Is uh, Here he comes, Jeff Kipp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I have uh, updates on two current benchmark stock assessments in progress. The first is uh, American Shad. Uh, we do have a, our final stock assessment subcommittee call scheduled actually this coming Monday to finalize a few decision, decisions for that assessment. Um, final, following that call, we will finish report writing and the report will go to the technical committee at the end of this month. Uh, and then from there, we'll go to the peer reviewers. Uh, right now, we're focusing in on uh, either late May or early June for the peer review workshop. And then the results of that peer review will be presented to the Shad and River Herring Board at the August commission meeting. The other stock assessment I'll be providing an update on is the American Lobster stock assessment. Uh, we have our last in-person meeting for that stock assessment scheduled uh, at the end of this month. Um, that's going to be at URI. Um, we'll be meeting to finalize our base models for that assessment and address some of the other terms of reference uh, as part of that assessment. Uh, that stock assessment is scheduled to go to peer review this summer, and the results of that stock assessment will be presented to the American Lobster Board at the uh, Commission's annual meeting uh, this October. So if there are any questions on those two stock assessments, I can take those now. Any questions for Jeff? Jason. Thanks for that, Jeff. Um, I, I was wondering, I, I, think I, um, I think I heard positive information on this, but uh, um, has NOAA, uh, the help from NOAA kind of emerged from the right whale world and so are you guys getting more support now from NOAA on the lobster assessment work yeah it's become clear that our, our NOAA membership has you know the, their workload has been reduced on the the right whale work and all of that um, and so yeah that that has come around and we've been getting um, uh, more interaction with with those folks so yes it is prog uh, positive information to report back on that Any additional questions or comments for Jeff? Seeing none, thank you very much. Um, moving right along, uh, item number eight on the agenda is review, consider, and consider revisions to stock status definitions. Tony? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, back in August, we go through, or every August, we go through the annual performance of the stocks. Um, and in that annual performance of the stock, we have um, five stock categories that we place all the stocks into, rebuilt sustainable, recovering, rebuilding, concerned, depleted, and unknown. This past year, um, we realized we ran into an issue when we had the striped bass stock overfished and overfishing occurring that it didn't really fit into any of these categories. And we <coughs> spent quite a bit of time discussing that. Um, so we brought forward a memo that was in your briefing materials to recommend two new categories, um, overfished and overfishing. Um, under our current categories, uh, depleted um, is the only category that addressed overfished and overfishing. But for depleted, we are very specific to the fact that it's unclear whether fishing mortality is the primary cause for reduced stock size. In the um, suggested addition of overfished and overfishing to these categories, uh, in the overfished category, it is very clear that the decline is driven primarily by fishing mortality. And we're m making that distinction between depleted and overfished. Uh, we recognize that this is a little bit different than what Magnuson has in their definitions of um, overfished. 
that we're trying to be more transparent to the public about what's going on with these stocks, and that's why we made the recommendation to include include these. Um, we had these definitions reviewed by the Management and Science Committee, and that um, comment about the difference uh, did come forward. And so what we're looking for today is to um, see if the policy board is okay with adding these two additional categories to the annual performance of the stock. Shree. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't have a problem with, with these being brought forward. I just have um, on, on your table and the materials, you have a definition for concern that I would uh, just uh, recommend uh, wording wordsmithing on that. It's a little confusing. I would just indicate a stock with emerging issues. Developing and emerging are pretty much the same word. Um, thank you. Noted. Jason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, I'm also okay with, with these. I just um, have a little hesitation. So, you know, I, I think part of, I'll start here. So we have this tension of limited resources and a bunch of stocks that we continue to throw resources at that don't seem to help. Um, and I understand that. Um, I get a little worried though and to cut to the chase, at the MSC meeting, I was uh, present and offered, I think something we need to start looking forward to is developing some sort of a control rule around these stocks, like a winter flounder, like a northern shrimp, where we kind of objectively set some parameters around when we're going to stop investing but not giving up necessarily like when you know if uh, harvest drops below some amount then we're just going to stop worrying about you know trying to chase it all the way down to zero um, so you know I, I have more detailed thoughts on that but I want to get it back on the table I because I want to get away from this idea I think right now it's this binary um, thought process of you know, we need to keep worrying about it and investing in it, or we're just gonna forget it, throw our hands up and, and walk away from it. There is a middle way. So I just wanted to have that on the table. I think Jay, that's a second part of some of the information that we had brought back to the MSC and sort of looking at ways to provide better information to the policy board when we present the annual performance of the stock um, in order to help you all engage either with the species management boards or, um, or discussion here at the policy board on what to do with the stocks when they're being presented, in particular those stocks that are depleted or have concern um, and so and the management and science committee st still has work to do on that issue so i think it will continue and we'll come back to this board that sound good jason okay um so we do have some recommended new categories jim did you have a question were you ready for a motion I, I'm, yeah, I was going to say that if we have consensus around the table, I wasn't going to worry about the motion we'll just adopt by consensus. Do we have consensus around the table um, with the understanding of the word smithing from, uh, from Cherie? I think we have consensus. So uh, these, um, uh, these new recommended categories are approved by consensus. Thank you. Um, moving right along, um, review non-compliance findings. We don't have any. That's always nice. My first uh, time at the policy board, I appreciate the fact that that is the case. Um, we do have some other business to be brought before the board. Um, I think something that came up at the South Atlantic board. And Tony, you want to talk to that? And Jeff, just make sure I don't say anything out of place and... Um uh, just for the Red Drum assessment time frame. Uh, at the South Atlantic Board, the um, Assessment Science Committee and the Stock Assessment Committee presented a roadmap for a new Red Drum assessment. 
Previously, Red Drum was on the assessment schedule for 2022 through a CDAR review. Um, the management board from recommendations from this group uh, agreed that they should recommend to the policy board that that time frame change. Uh, we've had difficulties moving forward with Red Drum assessments in the past and we want to make sure that we bring forward something that is um, best for that species and provides good management advice to the South Atlantic Board. So what uh, is being recommended is to do a um, two-step process. Um, first, take two years to basically do a modeling workshop um, and, uh, and so we can come forward with the best model to bring forward for Red Drum and then take two additional years to actually do the assessment once we've provided um, a model to move forward with. So that would change the assessment schedule for Red Drum. We just want to make sure that that is something that this policy board is okay with. Um, we will still need to bring forward a full change and or bring forward a full schedule for the stock assessments in the coming years. When the policy board approved the assessment schedule, the last time it was noted that there were several assessments coming up next year or two years from now, and that that would have to be revisited um, based on state staff's time as well as commission staff time. So when we do that, recognizing that Red Drum is still on that schedule, um, we'll have to make some choices probably down the line soon. Any questions or concerns on that? Seeing none, I think you've got your direction, Tony. Perfect. Um, that is the last item. Is there anything, any other items of business for, whoa. Um, so much for that. Russell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to give a shout out to Tina Berger for uh, her job that she did representing Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission at the East Coast uh, Commercial uh, Fisherman's Trade Expo in Ocean City, Maryland in January. She did a good job of explaining what goes on at this, at this organization. I even learned a little bit from it. Uh, and for uh, the Q&A uh, time she gave, and uh, she did a great job. Thank you. Roy, did you have a, do you have your hand up? I did, Mr. Chair. And um, I should have brought this up when we were talking about our previous agenda item <coughs> concerning the ecosystem management. It occurred to me that we now have, uh, thanks to the elegant presentations the other day concerning potential impacts of menhaden on striped bass, striped bass being the species that we have identified thus far that's most um, dependent on menhaden dynamics. We don't know much about the other direction effects. In other words, are there effects of striped bass population abundance on menhaden or effects of striped bass population abundance on weak fish, for instance. So maybe that's something we ought to have in the back of our mind that these um, um, ecological diagrams go both ways and their potential impacts in each direction. Thank you. Uh, point, point well taken, Roy. Um, it will add that to the future list of thinking. Um, it certainly is one that um, is a reality. Um, I, I do, you're reminding me of a point that I forgot to bring up under the executive committee notes. Um, it was brought up to the executive committee, there, our attention that we did start striped bass very, very early based on the time uh, that was advertised. Um, we left some people off the table um, no actions were taken while they were here, but they were left out of the discussion. Uh, there's a point well taken by myself as chair and, and staff, so we're going to try to do our best to avoid those long, if we do see some sort of a long delay um, between the time we end a board and the time the next one starts, we'll ensure that we take those type of things into account, and I appreciate you bringing that to our attention, Roy. Uh, any other items to be brought before the policy board? Seeing none, I'd like a motion to adjourn and we'll jump right into the business session. Three. So adjourn. We have adjourned. Thank you. Uh